song says, surfed all over. Couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater. Hey, the boy, there's nobody greater. There's nobody greater. There is nobody greater. There is nobody, there is nothing greater than our God. Amen. And so, Father, we bask in the fact that, God, there's nobody greater than you, O oh Lord. And so, God, the song is not just a song, God, but it portrays a true reality. That, God, there's nobody greater, Father. God, your word says there's no other name under heaven by which men must be saved except the name of Jesus. And so, God, you says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, Lord, there is nobody greater. God, disciples once says, God, Lord, um, where should we turn, God, not to you, Father? And so, Lord, we turn to you, O oh God, because there's nobody greater, O oh God. And, Lord, what an appropriate song, God, for our current series, God, Just Ask. And so, God, right now, Father, we all have an ask. No matter how big, no matter how small, Father, we all have an ask. And I want to pray, God, that, Lord, we turn to you, Father, because there's nobody greater. I want to pray, God, we turn to you, God, because you love us, God. I want to pray, God, we turn to you because you give us the invitation to come to you, Father. I want to pray, God, that you would get, um, deal with the barriers that interfere, God, with us running to you and casting our cares upon you, Father. And so we give ourselves to you, God. It's in Jesus' name, I pray ask it all. Amen? Amen. We greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Isn't it good to be a believer in Christ? Isn't it good to be a believer in Jesus Christ and that we have a special relationship with him? There's a story told about a, um, a young girl who um, needed to go and ask her father for a specific thing. And, um, but she didn't go and ask her dad for a specific thing she wanted from her dad. So a couple of days went by and her mom asked her, would you go and talk to your dad? She said, I didn't go and talk to my dad. A couple more days went by, and the mom asked, well, did you go and talk to your dad? She says, no, I didn't go and talk to my dad. And so her mother was kind of getting frustrated. She said, she said, she said well, you know, sweetie, all you need to do is just go and ask your dad. A couple more days went by. She did not go and ask her dad. So her mom came back to her. She was almost pushing her and forcing her to go ask her dad. And she said, sweetie, I don't understand. You've got your dad who loves you. You've got your dad who cares for you. You've got your dad who's got ability and capability to respond to your request. Why are you afraid to go and ask your dad for what you need? And the daughter says, Mom, I'm not afraid to go and ask my dad for what I'm, I need or what I desire. I'm afraid of my dad's response. And how many of us find ourselves in the same predicament? It's not that we don't know that God doesn't have power. It's not that we don't know that God is not the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's not that we don't know that God has given us an invitation to, to come to him. It's not that we don't think that God doesn't have the power. Sometimes we are afraid to ask God because of God's response. What will God's response potentially be? And so if I go to God and I put myself out there and I bear my soul to God, but God does not respond affirmatively to my request, then what's the outcome? If I make it known publicly that I've gone to ask God for this request and God doesn't come through, then how will I look among my peers if God doesn't answer my prayer request affirmatively? The reality is sometimes we're not afraid to make a request of God is that we are afraid of the potential response of God. Amen? In Matthew chapter 7, we've got a beautiful passage here, and it's another Just Acts sermon. In Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 11, I'm sorry, starting at verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Amen. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Amen. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask of him. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, 
And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. I want to talk today about just ask for just response. Sometimes we're afraid of what God is going to say if we ask God for certain things. But in this passage, what's interesting, the first thing you see that, that, that stands out in this passage is the promise in just asking. He does not say he may not answer your prayer. He doesn't say he'll answer your prayer if you say it just right. He didn't say, you know what, if you ask me at just the right time, I'll respond. He didn't say, if, in fact, he, he did, didn't even say if you behave properly, I will respond to your request. He says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. He seems to give a guarantee of a response if you just ask. So the question becomes, are you asking God to respond to your prayers? Are you asking God for what you desire? Are you asking God for his wisdom? Now, it's interesting, this, this is situated in what we call the, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. It is the, um, it is the ethical platform for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew chapters um, 1 through 4 talk about the person of the king. Chapters 5 through 7 talk about the platform of the king. So now he's laying out his platform, and I was, I was reading through this, and I was studying. I said, man, this just seems so simple. I can preach this sermon in two minutes. Just ask God for what you need, and he'll give you a just response. Let's do offering, let's pray, and let's go home. In that order, smiling. <laughs> y'all don't want to laugh. Y'all. Is y'all smile frozen this morning? Smile at me already. <laughs> I'm just glad y'all are here, right? And so, I, you know, on the other, I, I went look, look at the temperature for you know, the, the, the um, forecast, right? You know, I could care less if God dumped 25 million inches of snow on us at 1 p.m. on Sunday, all right? Lord, why are you going to do it before one, God? I mean, you know, how come it couldn't be 60 again at um, 10 o'clock today, right? Smile at me. Watch this now. It just seems so simple that God gives, you know, he said, you ask, you seek, and you knock, and then you'll get a just response. We shared with you all last week on what um, comprised a just ask. And what comprises a just ask is that it is consistent with God's will. Any prayer request that you make that is consistent with God's will, that becomes a just prayer request. Today we look at, so you know what, you're going to get a just response when you just ask. Amen? And so how many of y'all have increased and piped up your prayer life? Because all you got to do is just ask. The first thing we see here in this passage is a promise in just asking. Verse 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. What you see here is a promise. Now, what's interesting here is that the word ask, circle it, the word seek and the word knock, all of those are in the imperative mood. In other words, the imperative mood says this is a command. It doesn't seem that way in the English, but in the Greek, it really is a command. The command is really ask, the command is really seek, and the command really is knock. And then he offers you this, this consequence that when you ask, when you seek and when you knock, then what happens is, is that, is that, is that, is that, is that God will allow you to find, God will open things up for you, and God will um, 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 give you what you ask for. Amen? Asking it will be given, seeking you will find, knocking it will be open for you. So, boy, here's the promise. Everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, it will be open. Look at verse 8. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks, it will be open. And so what God says here is basically there's a promise in just asking. That when you just ask, he will give you a just response. But many of us are concerned about the justice of God. Many of us are concerned about will God respond affirmatively? Will God respond appropriately? You know, prayer really is, as one person said, prayer is our declaration of dependence upon God. Amen. Prayer is our declaration, not of independence, but prayer is our declaration of dependence upon God. See, what happens is we have thought to ourselves that prayer is for the weak, that only weak people pray. May I suggest that 
only wise people pray. It's not merely weak people who pray, but there are, but, 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 but it is wise people who pray. Wise people believe John 15 when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. Wise people understand that, boy, we are the created and he is the creator. Wise people understand he declares the end from the beginning. Wise people understand that God responds affirmatively, watch this now, to those who seek him. But God responds non-affirmatively to those who think they can get it done on their own. Now, the reality is we have been conditioned against prayer. See, prayer says, you know what, I need some help. Prayer says, I can't do it all on my own. Prayer says, I need more than what I have. But society teaches us, pour yourselves up by your own bootstrings. He says, ask. He says, seek. He says, knock. We call this an iterative, um, a, a repetitive, an iterative command. It means to keep doing it over and 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 over again. So we think because the answer was no the first time, that it's always going to be no. We think because it was a hold up, let me get back to you, that boy, that must imply a no. But God, when he gives a just response, he gives it in his own timing. Amen? And so God wants us to continue to pursue him. God wants us to continue to knock. God wants us to continue to seek him. But the challenge is our, our mindset is, you know what, Lord, I asked you once. If you don't want to do it, you ain't got to do it. All right. I'm not going to beg you. All right. I mean, I, I'm an adult, Lord. I'm not going to beg you for anything. All righty. You know what? I'm an adult. If you don't want to do it, I'll do it for myself. Amen. Now, aren't those familiar phrases that we use? And boy, we don't recognize what those phrases imply about our self-indulgence and our self-dependency. But when it comes to God, the Bible says, what do we have that we have not received? And so everything we have, we have received from God. If it's our brilliance, we received it from God. If it's our jobs, we've received it from God. If it's our um, status in life, we've received it from God. Everything we have, we have received. Amen? We're not the author of our own fortunes. Watch this now. We think prayer is just for the delinquent and the deficient, but I want to tell you that prayer is for those who are dependent. Prayer is not just for the delinquent or the deficient, but prayer is for those who are dependent. Your prayer life is a reflection of your dependence upon God. What would stop you from just asking to receive a just response when you keep on asking, you keep on seeking, and you keep on knocking? Now, I know what some of you all say, well, Pastor, the Bible says that God don't want us um, repeating empty words in our prayer, and that's exactly right. He doesn't want us repeating empty words, but he's okay with us being repetitive and sincere prayer to him. Amen. Amen? So, boy, don't think that you are, well, God, I asked you once. I ain't going to ask you no more. And God, God, you know what, Lord, I sent you the email. Whatever you want to answer it, you can respond to it, God. I sent you the text, God. I know you got the text, God. In fact, God sent you the text. And the question was, boy, not if he, boy, he receives your text. The question becomes, did you read his text, this text right here? Amen. And when you read his text, he tells you that he's sovereign, he's providential, he invites you to prayer, he tells you to keep asking, he tells you to keep seeking, he tells you to keep knocking. The question becomes, do you believe that God will do what he said he will do? The first thing we see in this prayer is the promise, the promise, not with a T, but the promise, smile at me, and just asking. The second thing you see in verse 9 is the parallel of just asking. He says in verse, um, verse 9, Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? And so God comes here, and basically what he talks about is positive paternity. Say paternity. paternity. You know, with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the varying degrees of of presence of a father or the varying degrees of Christian fathers, we typically don't associate faith with fatherhood. 
And so when it comes to Christianity, we think about our moms, the ones who nurture us, the ones who love us, the ones who take care of us. But we typically don't think first about a loving father. This passage emphasizes positive paternity as identified through your relationship with your father. You know, I was thinking about this passage on prayer, and boy, how simple this principle was, just to ask and get a just response. And I said, well, Lord, why should people want to pray? And God, why don't people want to pray more? And it dawned on me that, you know what, this, this passage will only resonate with you if your orientation and your foundation is in the kingdom of God. See, boy, prayer is not important if you're not trying to live for the kingdom. Prayer is obsolete if you're trying to make a difference for the kingdom. You say, well, Pastor, everything is fine in my life. You know, I'm, I'm educated. I got a good job. My kids are doing well. And my 401K, it's not where I want it to be, but it's building. Smile at me. Well, boy, if that's your measure for kingdom prayer, you've got the wrong measuring stick. Amen. See, boy, when you're a kingdom person, what you're finding in the Bible, when you're a kingdom person, you don't have to go find trouble. Trouble will find you. In this life, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. If they hated him first, surely they will hate us as well. Amen? See, guys, the goal of Christianity is not to live your life in such a way where non-believers and critics of Christianity applaud you. That's not the goal. The goal is to live our lives in such a way where the King of Kings is proud of us where the King of Kings applauds us. We live to an audience of one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We live for kingdom purposes. We live for kingdom outcomes. And when you live for kingdom outcomes, the devil's going to come knock on your door. The devil may go and ask like he did with Job. He may come and ask for permission. He may seek after you. He may knock on God's door and says, can I touch him? And God say, you can touch everything about him, but do not touch his soul. Watch this now. Are you the kind of Christian where trouble finds you rather than you finding trouble? I can guarantee you when you live for God, you will find consternation. When you live for God, you will end up with enemies. When you live for God, people who don't know God, who don't live for God, who don't like God will not like you. Amen? And so the goal of the church is not to become just like the world so the world becomes just like us. If we are just like the world, why should the world want to become part of the church? Because they already got what they want, amen? We will never outdo the world at being the world. So the question becomes, watch this now, have you identified with a positive paternity? Calling him Abba, Father. It just sounds strange to boy, to boy have intimacy with your father. It sounds strange because we have this impression of men and males and fathers of big, bad, braggadocious, uh, will slam you, who will fight with you, will argue with you. But there's a compassion inside of our God. Amen? Our God is what um, Stu Weber called a tender warrior. He is tender. He is kind. He is gracious. He is nurturing. But he's also a warrior. Amen? The same arms that hug your kids can protect your kids. The same arms that give to your children ought to be the same arms that can go up in arms and protect your kids. Do you understand positive paternity? You've got a daddy that loves you. You've got a daddy who wants to encourage you. You've got a daddy who wants to relate to you. Just mention the term daddy in the African-American community can cause a traumatic response. Seven out of ten African-American kids born today um, are born into a single-parent family household. And many of them are born, and boy, their mother takes care of them. Amen. So when you talk about a daddy, there's not a positive image for a daddy. There's not a positive role model for many with their daddy. But guys, you better get over it because when you come to the Bible, you've got a father that transcends your race. You've got a father that transcends your disappointment. You've got a father that transcends your trauma. You've got a father that loves you. You've got a father that cares. You've got a father who invites you. You've got a father who wants to hold you and nurture you. Amen? And so the first thing we see in this text, we see a positive, I'm sorry, the promise in just asking. The next thing is the parallel of just asking. He says, oh, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, we'll give him a serpent. In other words, watch this now. God does two things. The first illustration says that God wants to give you what is useful. Amen. God wants to give you what is useful. 
He says here in verse 9, he says, if you ask him for bread, will he give you a stone? If you're hungry, a stone is useless. I'll be tracking together. God wants to give you what is useful. So when you go to God in prayer, you better understand that God at some level is a utilitarian God. God wants to give you what you need. God wants to give you what you, what you um, stand in desire of. God wants to give you what is useful. But number two, he says, he says, he will not give you what is harmful, but he will give you what is helpful. Amen. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now, guys, you know what? If you ask for fish, you know, whether it's catfish, it's, it's, um, it's Chilean sea bass. And so uh, my wife, she likes, she, likes, she, likes, she likes bass. She likes Chilean sea bass. Are we tracking together? And so I said, you know what? I can't find no Chilean sea bass. And so I, I searched all over. <laughs> Couldn't find nobody <laughs> that had Chilean sea bass already. So I finally found the store. They said, well, we got bass. So I drove to the store, and I get there, and I said, that don't look like Chilean sea bass. It's just bass. I said, well, you know, I tell y'all, well, go ahead and come on. But it still had the head on. I said, well, cut the head off and cut the skin off, and maybe she won't recognize it ain't Chilean sea bass already. So I had to wrap it up real nice, and I got home, and I said, babe, I got some. I got some bass. And so I said, I'm going to go ahead and cook it. I don't cook all the time. I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and cook it for you, all right? So I cooked the bass, and I took it in there, too. I pulled the stuff I would put on the Chilean sea bass. And I said, well, so how was the fish? She said, it was all right, but that wasn't Chilean sea bass, was it? <laughs> how many of y'all who asked for bass would be satisfied with Chilean? I said, well, who asked for Chilean bass would be satisfied with just regular old bass? God, watch this now. He only gives us what's useful. God will give us what is helpful. Watch this now. Do we understand that when you go to God and you ask God for something, sometime in God's response, God says, what you're asking for may not be helpful for you. What you're asking for may create more distance between me and you. What you're asking for, I want to give it to you at the right time, but right now, you're not ready to receive this. Sometimes we ask for stuff that God said, I want to give it to you, but if I give it to you now, it would destroy you rather than develop you. Some of you all are asking for promotions, and God said, you have a hard time getting to work and doing your load. <laughs> and now you're asking for a bigger load. You don't understand what you're asking for. Come on, when you go to a next level, you can't do the same thing you're doing right now. One mistake people make when they get a promotion, they do the same thing that got them the promotion. And very often when you get the promotion, you've got to do something different than what got you the promotion. I think as a guy wrote a book, he says, what got you here won't take you there. Sometimes God can't bless you for what you're asking for because you're not ready for what you're asking for. If you can't be faithful over these few things, why should God bring you more? How are we tracking together? So watch this now, the parallel of just asking that, but God knows how to give good gifts. Number three, starting at verse 11, you see the poignancy of just asking. You see, the poignancy of just asking, just look it up, P-O-I-G-N-A-N-C-Y. I know you said, Pastor, I made up another word. I will make up a word, but I didn't make up that one. All right, he smile at me. It's the poignancy of just asking. Verse 11 says, if you then who are evil, now watch this now, God didn't hesitate, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't try to cover it, he didn't put velvet on it. He says, if you then who are evil, that should mess up your theology. I'm a believer in God. How are you going to call me evil? I've got the Holy Spirit. How are you going to call me evil? I read your word. How are you going to call me evil? Because God has yet to glorify you. And until God glorifies you, you still got evil on the inside of you. Your destiny may be changed. But boy, watch this now. There's still an element of you who's still evil. Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to his disciples because he says he knew their heart. When you read Psalm 51, when you read Romans chapter 6, don't miss out on good, healthy, biblical anthropology that we are still evil until God takes us home to glory. We may not be as evil as we used to be. <laughs> right? May not be as ugly as we used to be, but we're still evil and we're still ugly. For all have sinned, past tense, and come short, present tense, of the glory of God. Since we fall short of the glory of God, we're evil. Uh, um, First John says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves, and you're a liar. Are we tracking together? 
Guys, we're still, we, we still have a component of evil. Um, Romans chapter 7 says, whenever I would try to do good, evil is always present. It says verse 11a, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. You know what? Even in your spiritual condition, even in your spiritual state, even in where you are right now spiritually, you have not made it to total glorification yet. And that's our goal, total glorification, Romans chapter 8. Our total goal, I'm sorry, our, our goal is total transformation and total, um, 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 total identity with our identity in Christ. Amen? It's to look just like Jesus. That's our goal, to look just like Jesus. Our goal is not just to secure our eternity. Amen. Our goal is to look just like Jesus in our character, our conduct, and our communication. Our goal is to be just like Jesus. Our goal is not to compare ourselves to most people who don't know Christ. Amen. Our goal is to be just like him. Amen? And so your destiny, thus destiny church, is to become conformed to his image. Our goal is to be just like him. But watch this now. Prior to achieving total glorification, total sanctification, and being just like him, he says, you know how to give good gifts to your children. We just came out of a season where you all went and found the best gift your money could buy for your loved ones. You didn't take your kids in there what they did not want. You took your kids exactly what they wanted. Any parent worth they sought. If you've got a kid, and boy, you love that child, you want to give that kid everything you can. Amen? So much so, we disable our kids sometimes, and we handicap our kids, because the struggles our kids need to grow up and build the character they need, we help them circumvent that because we give it to them too easily. That's another sermon, all right? Watch this now. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, and then he argues from lesser to greater... How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? He says, watch this now. If you know how to give good gifts and you are evil and you're still on earth and you're the created rather than the creator, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Here's that positive paternity again. He makes reference to your heavenly Father how well do you relate to your heavenly Father? Do you understand the care of your heavenly Father? Do you understand the character of your heavenly Father? Do you understand the capacity of your heavenly Father? Do you understand your heavenly Father has a kingdom, but he wants you to live according to his kingdom? Because if you know how to give good gifts, how much more does your heavenly Father know how to give good gifts? Amen. So every time Christmas comes again, Every time the birthday comes again, every time the graduation gift comes, you say, if I know how to bring this gift to my children, how much more does my heavenly father know how to give good gifts to me? In the parallel passage over in the book of Luke, he, he doesn't just say good gifts. He, he says that gift is the Holy Spirit. Different passage, probably different background, different story here. He says, your father knows how to give good things to you. It's your relationship. It's your, expe it's your expectancy. It's your request factor. Amen. We, talk about, we talk about all types of factors. Talk about IQ. That's your, that's your intelligence quotient. We talk about um, EQ today, your emotional intelligence. What is your, what is your RF? What is your request frequency? Amen. How frequently are you asking God? And then when you're asking, what are you asking God for? Is it for his will? Is it for his glory? Is it for his majesty? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven good things give good things to those who ask him? The key is to just ask so you can get a just response. Well, what makes a just response just? Is God unjust? Isn't that really the parallel? If you ask for a fish, you receive a stone. I'm sorry, if you ask for bread, you get a stone. If you ask for a fish, you get a snake. The question calls into um, the question calls into question. It calls what makes a just response just? What kind of response will God give us? What kind of what kind of response will God say to us? Amen. Y'all got to become like one of my sons. 
We can do the most major thing for him in the world, and five minutes later, he sends another request. <laughs> he means no harm. I tell you, that boy, he will ask. You hear me? I say, boy, just stop asking for stuff, all right? But, but, but maybe I'm wrong because the Bible wants us to, to keep asking. Amen. The Bible models that a child should continue to ask his father for what he desires and for what he needs. Just make sure it's a just ask. Verse 7 commands us to keep on asking, to keep on seeking, to keep on knocking. And so, boy, what is a just answer from God? How do I know when God has answered my prayer affirmatively? Number one, it's consistent with your kingdom relationship with him. See, in this passage, this is not written to non-believers. This is written to believers. This is written to people who are disciples. This are written to people who are followers of Christ. Now, he didn't qualify with anything else, but boy, you have a relationship with me. The fact that you have a relationship with him means that God is more than happy to hear from you. Amen? Amen. And so, number one, a, a just response means it's based upon your kingdom relationship. Number two, a just response says, you know what, it's consistent with his kingdom purposes. God is answering your request based upon his kingdom purpose for your life. Ephesians 2.10 says that, boy, you were created unto good works. God knows what good works he has for your life ordained already. The question becomes, will you walk in alignment with what the good works are? Um, God has for you. John 17, 3 and 4 says, Jesus says, Father, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work thou hast asked me to do. When you get the work, he's just going to ask. Smile at me. Amen. Did you do the work I ordained you to do? Did you do the work I placed you on the planet for? He's not going to ask you if you did somebody else's work. He's not going to ask you if you achieved somebody else's purpose. He's not going to ask you if you just really did a good thing. He's going to ask, did you complete the work I have called you to do? So God doesn't answer our prayers based upon what he wants to do in somebody else's life. God answers our prayers based upon his purpose for our lives. Amen. Number three, a just response is consistent with kingdom principles. God's going to answer your prayers based upon what his word already says. Amen. That's why it's important to know his word, because he responds to us based upon what his word says. So here's the question. You say, well, pastor, if I'm going to heaven, why should I put forth all this effort to live a kingdom life? And it really comes down to distinctiveness. You all good? It's distinctive between living a natural life and living a supernatural life. See, what God does for believers he intersects with your natural and empowers you to live a supernatural life, even though you're not a super spiritual being. Amen. We're tracking together? And see, we think, well, Pastor, when you say supernatural, then that must mean you want God to change our consistency from being humanity and from being flesh. And you want God to make us a robot. You want God to make us a different type of creation. No, it's special being humanity. The Bible says in Hebrews that the, that, the, that, the, that the angels long to look into God's salvation plan for your life. It's special to be human. Amen. There are a third of the angels who will never experience eternal life with Christ because they, they followed Satan and God didn't give them a redemption plan. Amen. But when Adam and Eve, am I going too far for y'all? But when Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, God put together a redemption plan and, and, put a, and put a restoration plan in place and put a comeback plan in place. He put a revival plan in place for us because we are special. We are his humanity. He may not change the consistency um, of our humanity, but he gives you a new capacity to live a supernatural life. See, when he's talking to his disciples here, he's talking to them about kingdom living. He's talking to them about supernatural living. He's not, you know what, this is how it looks when you don't have the Holy Spirit. He says, this is how it looks when you fully follow me. Amen. This is how it looks when you're fully committed to me. So here's the question. You want to live a natural life or a supernatural life? See, watch this now. If not in love with God's kingdom, then kingdom living does not appeal to you. We're not interested in following the king and submitting to the king. You're not interested in his kingship and his kingdom. And so watch this now. The distinction comes down to the qualities the quality and consistency which impacts one's internal peace and external outcomes. Let me say it again because I had to read it myself, right? <laughs> Watch this now. It impacts the quality and the consistency of your life 
which impacts your internal peace and external outcomes. See, we live in a world where we're just primarily concerned about, Pastor, tell me truth as it pertains to my daily outcomes. Pastor, if it doesn't impact my daily outcome, and, and Pastor, I mean me. When I say me, Pastor, I really mean me. Pastor, if it does not impact, intersect, and, and boy, directly influence my personal, my family's, or my sphere's outcomes, then, Pastor, I'm really not interested in it. And a disservice of the church, the universal church today, is that we go try finding sermons that are all about you. We go try finding sermons about me, myself, and my family. And then, boy, we get pressured to think that, you know what, if it's not just about you, yourself, and your family, it's not important, and we shouldn't preach it. All right, so now we got passages, large amounts of passages. We don't even preach from the Bible because it doesn't line up with what a carnal mindset says is relevant. See, this isn't relevant to you unless you've got a kingdom desire. Amen. This isn't relevant to you unless you have a kingdom mindset. And what happens is it's counterintuitive. When you're trying to give people everything they want, but you leave out what God wants, you ultimately turn what they want against what God wants for their lives. Amen. Amen. But when you do what God wants, then God will give you everything he wants you to have. Amen? Amen. So the question becomes, you want to live a natural life or you want to live a supernatural life? You may have the same clothes may have the same body, may have the same address. But the question becomes, do you have inner peace? And do you have the outcomes that God has ordained for your life because of the quality of your life and the consistency of your asking, your seeking, and your knocking? So, Father, may we just ask so we can receive a just response. And God, sometimes, God, we're afraid to come and ask you, God, not because we're afraid to ask, but because, God, we're afraid of your response. So, God, I applaud Brother Holman today saying, Pastor, I want the church to pray for me because my treatments are not working. And God, yet once again, God, as he does with me in private, God, he's done in public today, God. He's demonstrated wisdom with us, Father. So I pray, God, that, Lord, we put our faith on the line. I pray, God, we go public, God. I pray, God, that we trust, God, that you're going to give us exactly what we need, Father. And that, God, we're not trying to press you for an outcome. But, God, we're coming to you, God, because you're a loving Father, because you care for us, because you want the best for us, God. And because, God, you're going to do what's best for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are some who may be online or maybe, maybe some who are here present today. And you can't benefit from this sermon until you make Jesus Christ your Lord. So, well, Pastor, how do I make him my Lord? Does that mean I've got to do everything right? I've got to do all that. No, that's not what that means at all. What it means is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What it means is that you have to admit that you're a sinner, just like all of us. We're sinners. Amen. What happens is Satan starts working right now. He says, well, I'm afraid or ashamed to say I'm a sinner. We all have sinned, past tense. And come short of the glory of God, present tense. Now, we don't celebrate sin, but we admit that we are in need of a Savior. And so what God did was he sent his only begotten son who lived the perfect life. And boy, he lived the perfect life. So when he died on the cross for us, it could pay the debt for our sin. And so Christ died on heaven's cross. The Bible used the term propitiation. It means that God found satisfaction in killing Christ for our sins. Christ died in our place. Another way of saying it, we call it substitutionary atonement. That Christ was the substitute for our sins. Christ died for our sins. But the third thing is this. Will you trust him? To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So will you make Christ your Savior today? Will you, will you, will you openly confess? Will you put your full trust in him? Will you rely upon him not your good deeds, not your good job, not your good education, but Christ and Christ alone. Amen? So I want to give an invitation today. I want to ask you all to respond to Christ. Not because you had a praying grandmama, not because you went to church, not because you have a Bible, but because you recognize you're a sinner, but God has sent his son as your savior. And you want to put your trust in him and him alone. Amen? Amen.